So, dear colleagues, we are going to start. There are not very numerous so far, but uh, people will get here hopefully in, in the following quarter of an hour, uh, finding their ways on the campus or uh, targeting the exact minute when the workshop is meant to start to, to get here. Anyway, we'll see. But um, we would like to welcome you and thank you all for being here. And um, we have a really great uh, series of uh, presentations and uh, colleagues um, uh, all of today. And so we are very grateful that all of them uh, came here uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, cities and uh, climate change policies, international climate change policies. And so um, this workshop is um, the uh, final uh, workshop in a series of five that was uh, uh, organized by LATS on behalf of APUCA, which is uh, uh, the research department of the French uh, Ministry for Sustainable uh, Development, National Ministry for Sustainable Development. And uh, the uh, general idea of a series of workshops is to uh, question the uh, um, new or uh, con at least contemporary dimension of uh, 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 internationalization uh, in uh, how cities are governed and how cities develop and uh, how cities relate to, um, uh, to each other. And um, so there, were, there was one introduction workshop and then four thematic workshops, uh, uh, one on city branding, so to speak, and the internationalization of uh, city images. So it was, the workshop was called Putting Cities on the World Map, and so it discussed all sorts of uh, cities, labeling, competition, events, uh, to, uh, to appear uh, on the world map, regardless of, uh, uh, of your size in particular. Uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, second uh, workshop uh, uh, dealt with the uh, model of the uh, a uh, neoliberal city and how it uh, circulated and was appropriated world, worldwide uh, in uh, various guises and whether there was uh, such a global model that was adapted or there were, whether there was uh, several uh, 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 models uh, in parallel or several uh, policy uh, uh, paradigms. Uh, the third workshop was on uh, migrations, international migrations and how they affect cities and how cities deal with them. And, and, um, and, uh, and, re and respond to uh, the um, situations created by mass, mass migrations. And then this uh, uh, workshop then is on um, uh, uh, global environmental change in cities and, um, and with a specific focus on, on climate change, which is of course emblematic of these global environmental changes, uh, but not, um, uh, not the only one, obviously. And so Syria will uh, uh, discuss a program of um, today's uh, workshop. But the, as you can see, the general idea is to um, try and uh, <clears throat> see how cities uh, address uh, international uh, issues and how the uh, uh, increasing internationalization of uh, 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 the uh, economies, of uh, policy networks, of uh, uh, circulations of all sorts of uh, uh, objects um, uh, affect urban development. And there will be um, early in 2018 uh, a conference that will uh, uh, kind of uh, rediscuss the uh, uh, outcomes of this series of workshops and will, of course, keep you all informed of, um, of this um, conference. And maybe some of you will even be involved in the program. Um, <clears throat> but the idea will then be after these thematic workshops to, uh, uh, to try and, and, and discuss more generally how uh, cities are affected by this new wave of uh, internationalization, so to speak. So I want to say much more, uh, just to say that um, there might not be so many people in the audience today um, uh, for all sorts of uh, reasons, but um, the uh, presentations will be uh, recorded, video recorded, and uh, unless the, uh, uh, um, uh, the colleagues disagree, they will be uh, uh, put on the web and um, advertised so that people who cannot attend the conference will be able to, uh, uh, to listen to the presentations uh, uh, later in time. And also, and this will discuss with the um, 
with, with people uh, speaking today. We are planning um, uh, to have some kind of publication, but we want to discuss that with them first and see if it makes sense and, 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 and when and where that would be. Uh, that would be feasible. We think, and Syria and I, that it would be very valuable because we have this combination of perspectives on, on, on the um, workshops issues, but um, then we, we need to discuss that obviously in, in detail before we can make any kind of uh, more precise announcement. So, um, so we'll, um, we'll take the, the best of the, um, of the workshop and even if um, the audience is not too numerous today, we'll uh, we'll make it um, known and publicize it as much as we can. So, thank you uh, for coming and thanks in particular for our um, colleagues here and I'll leave the floor to Syria now to present the program in more detail. Okay, I, will, uh, I would like to add a few words concerning the backbone, the common thread of this workshop. Today we want to investigate the political and geopolitical dimensions of urban climate action. This discussion will not so much focus on outcomes of local climate action in terms of urban planning or urban forms, but rather on the contribution of local climate action to a politicization of the climate question. To what degree are cities becoming global actors? able to decentralize regulation of global change? What are the modes of transnational structuration and strategical action over the last 20 years? What results have been achieved? What, what were the limitations? Local climate plans are born in the wake of foreign local policies in response to inaction by national governments, particularly the United States, some cities have found within themselves political resources with the help of transnational municip municipal networks to open new paths, among them fossil fuel free strategies. Is this decentralized mode of action more likely to favor energy and environmental justice or a democratization for, of climate action? This is the first set of questions we, we wish to address in today's workshop. We have invited Harriet Bulkley, a professor at the University of Durham, a specialist of these issues for more than 15 years. <laughs> Secondly, uh, to recognize the political uh, resources of the cities doesn't mean that their climate action presents a unified front. Divergences, conflict, leadership rivalries, my English is quite bad, are part of a political process. In order to gain a more endogenous understanding of the visions of energy transition in municipal transnational networks, we will hear from Jeb Brugman and Claire Roumé, leaders of the two most important climate and energy action municipal networks. Jeb Brugman is a founder and longtime head of ICLEI, creating a new generation of urban policies, such as Local Agendas 21 and Local Climate Plans. Claire Rome is a head of Energy Cities, a network particularly involved in the constitution of first the European, then the Global Covenant of Mayors. And from a more academic uh, perspective, Michel Akuto, professor at the UCLA, UCL London, <laughs> University College London, will tell us more about another global and transnational initiative, the C40 Municipal Network. David Gordon, assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, will then analyze this diplomacy of cities in the light of a global political ecology, or something like that. The mixture of actors and researchers will allow us to deepen the discussion about ambitions, strategic action, visions, difficulties and contradictions of urban climate action. Let, but let, 
last but not least, we will address at the end of the day some case studies such as Paris, Sao Paulo and some European capitals in order to examine the links between global networking and the evolution of both local and national climate policies, particularly with the case of Sao Paulo for the bus evolution. Uh, so, Sao Paulo case study will be presented by Joanna Setzer, researcher at the London School of Economics. The Paris climate policy will be discussed by Yann Françoise, in charge of it at the Ville de Paris. And Clémence Dubois will explain the diverse project led by the NGO uh, 350.org. Uh, we hope so that you will enjoy this program. Uh, I think we can start. We can. We will now open the session on the first session on political dimensions of transnational urban diplomacy. Oh, you can stay here. Yeah, and we invite Ayed Berkeley to join us on the stage. Perhaps a few words on Harriet. Harriet, uh, is, you are a professor at the Durham University, professor of political geography. You have conducted numerous works on urban and transnational climate action and governance. Before you talk, can you tell us why and how you have discovered this topic? <laughs> I certainly can do that. Um, actually, it was uh, 20 years ago today that I gave my first talk on cities and climate change at a conference in New York, so I'm feeling very old today. Um, but, uh, and uh, at that time, it was, uh, anyway, we, well, I'll tell you about that time shortly. Um, but in terms of how I came to do this research, I was doing my PhD research on Australia's climate politics, mm -hmm. and I was uh, based partly for a year of my PhD, which I was taking at the University of Cambridge. I spent about a year at Macquarie University in New South Wales, the north of Sydney. And when I, uh, naively, when I got to Australia, I was looking for a city where I felt that the sort of the challenges between acting on climate change and acting in the best interests of the city would be in conflict, a sort of classic environment uh, economy conflict, which is what Australia's climate politics appeared to be at the time, and that hasn't much changed over the last 25 years, it has to be said. Uh, and the city that I chose to, to work in was called Newcastle. Uh, I live quite close to Newcastle now, actually, but uh, Newcastle in Australia, three hours north of Sydney, it's one of the largest coal ports in the world and had a major steel factory there, employing about 80,000 people until the mid-1980s. Um, but when I got there, they were ruining my PhD by joining this network of cities on climate protection. I was like, no, this is all wrong. You're supposed to be against climate change because you've got this big coal resource here. What are you doing? Um, and so it was a, a happy accident to have my preconceptions about the way the world is organized and, and what it is that makes politics work, uh, challenged by that. Um, and there's a much longer story about how that all emerged in Newcastle, which maybe I shall share over a beer if anybody's interested. But it did start with somebody having an argument about how to turn the lights off in a bus garage, is how Newcastle <laughs> ended up taking action on climate change and eventually persuading the Australian uh, national government to donate seven million Australian dollars towards a program or cities climate protection program. So more arguments about how to turn the lights off probably needed to get action happening. So, yeah, there we are. So that was where it was from, yeah. So more happy accidents in research as well. I think it's, um, yeah, we can, we can have a clear idea about what we think the research problem is and the research question to start with in our, in our research work. But of course, it's always the, those kind of new discoveries that help kind of animate what it is that we do. So, um, originally, I was asked to talk about 20 years of, of uh, climate diplomacy, but actually when I started looking at my records and my notes, I, I feel that it's really worth thinking about this over a period of a quarter of a century. It's 25 years since uh, 
the Rio conference uh, in June in 1992, and probably that we can take as a kind of landmark moment for City's engagement uh, with issues around sustainability in general and climate change in particular. So um, that's, uh, in a way, where we'll start. Um, I found this amazing picture of uh, Christina Figueres and um, oh, uh, the ex-mayor of New York, whose name is escaping me now, Bloomberg, and the European, a previous European commissioner, who apparently now in charge of uh, the largest uh, city's climate protection network, the Global Covenant for Mayors for Climate and Energy. And it just struck me as kind of a very intriguing photograph. So how did we get to this point where the previous leader of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change negotiations, uh, a city politician and a philanthropist and a European, and a European president, uh, president of the European Commission, are together united around the idea of, of climate change diplomacy through the city. So I think that at least bears some thinking about of how did we get here, how did we get to this kind of position where these different kind of actors and the different resources, finance, knowledge and networks that they bring together are aligned in, in this photograph. So if we can cast ourselves back to the early 1990s, it is worth um, thinking a little bit about how far cities have come in terms of addressing uh, climate change and environmental sustainability. Um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the environment was viewed predominantly as separate from and indeed in need of protection from cities. A long-standing tradition in Western thought, the separation of nature and culture, of civility and the wild, uh, placed the environment and environmental protection as essentially a rural problem uh, across Europe and indeed across, across the world. That environmental protection was about protecting purely environmental places from the rest of us and particularly from cities. So on the one hand, we have a, a quite a clear division between environmental protection and the city. And on the other hand, we have a very strong framing of climate change following the ozone uh, depletion uh, issue in the 1980s as a global problem of common pool resources that required global common action. So that is a very unlikely starting point for cities to become the center of addressing climate change. We've got cities as being anti-environment and you've got climate change as a global problem. But those two things have shifted and it's the shift of both of those axes that have allowed uh, cities to take a position. To get to where we are today, the latest global alliance, over 7,400 cities, a large proportion of uh, global population committing to the global covenant of mayors for climate and energy. So I'm going to speak a little bit about how that transition has happened and some of what I think are the current sort of trends in that area. What happened in the 19, early 1990s, and I hope we'll hear more about this from Jeb Brookman, who is of course an essential architect to this transition, um, was that cities starting through Local Agenda 21, but mobilizing actually before then around greenhouse gas emissions, started to be able to position themselves as having three key uh, capacities or critical, um, critical skills that they were contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, so they should have some level of responsibility. They had capacity, they were local governments, they had a democratic mandate, and that there were co-benefits to be realized from taking action on, on climate change that they wanted access to. And it was this, that, this kind of triple argument that was made, the relationship between the contribution, capacities, and the co-benefits that propelled cities into the heart of the debate. The map probably at least gives you an impression of what uh, the state of transnational climate change membership looked like, at least in the European region. In uh, the late 1990s, a map uh, developed by Christina Kern in, in some work that she and I did together. Um, it shows uh, predominance of transnational climate networks in uh, Germany and German-speaking regions, Italy, France with energy cities and the UK and Finland. We've never been able to ex explain why Finland got so involved with cities and climate change in the late 1990s. That, that's a PhD topic for someone. Um, but what we saw is the three main networks, the Climate Alliance, ICLEI's urban, initially ICLEI's urban carbon dioxide reduction project, which then became the Cities for Climate Protection Network, and energy cities, which started 
as a European project with six cities. Um, those networks grew throughout the 1990s, uh, accumulating membership and leading to a picture of this kind in the late 1990s. Some work that um, Michelle Betzel and I, some of you may know, wrote uh, one of the first uh, long discussions of this, some might say too long, uh, in our book on cities and climate change, where we looked specifically at the cities and climate protection network in the US, Australia, and, and in the UK in the late 1990s, that book published in 2003. Uh, recently, we were asked to look back at that work and to think about how our perspective might have changed. And in, that, in looking back at what we had done 10 years later, uh, we made this argument that the 1990s could be characterized by what we've now called municipal voluntarism. So maybe we didn't see it at the time when we were writing, but it was a particular kind of characteristic of how cities and climate protection governance was taking place. Uh, dominated by a few pioneering cities focused on mitigation, using a targets and timetables kind of approach, which was common in the international arena at the time as well, um, mostly based on in-house reductions of greenhouse gas emissions rather than what are also called community emissions beyond the city uh, government estate and dominated by kinds of forms of self-governing and trying to enable other actors to take action. So we call it municipal voluntarism for the reasons that it's dominated by municipal actors and it's largely voluntary. So we put two words together, came up with uh, this phrase um, and this form of municipal voluntarism was also echoed with Local Agenda 21. I think it, it bears a lot of the same kind of similarities to what Local Agenda 21 was like in the 1990s. Municipalities wanted to be playing a role on the environmental stage and this was a way these transnational networks and Local Agenda 21 were ways in which they could do that. So in some senses these networks flourished because they gave a kind of global legitimacy to the need or a sense of the importance of taking local action. It was easier to kind of make the argument that you were an important city if you were part of these. But looking again, sort of slightly retrospectively about what these networks offered, we can look at three sets of factors that seem to shape the extent to which cities are able to act on climate change, institutional, political, socio-technical. We can see that in terms of institutional terms, these networks were very successful. They offered knowledge and resources. They helped cities realize what their specific competencies were by sharing good practice. They um, helped them navigate the kind of complexity of multi-level governance, sometimes circumventing national governments who were anti-climate change action, such as the US and Australia, at other times giving resources to cities, such in the case of Sweden and, and Germany, where national or state level resources were available and they helped cities negotiate that. On the political factors, they're slightly more ambivalent. They helped to promote leadership and created windows of opportunity with this sort of reporting cycles and knowledge generation. But they failed really to kind of address some of the kind of conflicts around what development agendas might look like in any particular cities or with any particular vested interests. And in the work that Michelle and I had done in the late 1990s and early 2000s, it was particularly in the transport sector that vested interests were very strong. And the idea of sort of changing away from a carbon-based transport system to anything else was met with very limited results from cities who were trying to take action in that sphere. I'll come on to later the fact that Broadly speaking, you say that in social, technical or infrastructural terms, these networks were very ephemeral. They didn't really shape resources or decision making around in existing infrastructure systems or how new kinds of social, technical infrastructures might be built. And in a sense, it's the way in which those networks were then able to release the power of urban responses that then by the late 1990s led to the sort of stabilization and their kind of tailing off. And again, I think it's an interesting parallel to look at the story of Local Agenda 21 because basically by the end of the 1990s, Local Agenda 21 was saturated. All cities who were going to join Local Agenda 21 had joined. Nobody else joined and it didn't really go anywhere. So even though the UK, you have Tony Blair being elected that part of his manifesto promise was that all local authorities should join Local Agenda 21, so they all did. 
and then not much else happened after that. So you have a kind of political promise of a kind of democratic, locally engaged sustainability, but by the late 1990s, it doesn't appear to go anywhere. So there are various different reasons which we can give for why by the late 1990s, you see this membership um, tailing off, and this is a figure from the Climate Alliance, again, from Christina Kern's work uh, with me, a couple of papers that we published together on these issues. Um, climate change basically remained an issue of marginal concern for the most part of local government. So for most of the um, departments within local government, especially in transport, but elsewhere, uh, climate change was marginal. It was championed by one or two people within the local authority who had had the ability to get it onto the agenda, but then once it was on the agenda, they couldn't realize it. They couldn't do anything with that agenda. They didn't have the capacity to, to move it forward. And so in a sense, that might have been the end of that story. It would have been a nice part of my early career and then I would have had to decide to do something else. <laughs> I just had to stop talking about cities and climate change for 20 years, uh, which possibly would have been a shame. Um, but so, and we can see the end of that story with Local Agenda 21. I think the parallel is really interesting, actually. But just when uh, it might then have seen that cities' action might have leveled off, you have a sort of what is a relatively large shift in the overall landscape of climate governance taking place. And so cities catch, if you like, a second wave of action. So this graph is taken from a book that I wrote with a group of colleagues called Transnational Climate Change Governance. It's what, some of what I do when I'm not looking at cities. Um, and in that, uh, a, in a group of us, about 18 of us worked over a period of four years. Ten of us then went on and wrote a, a book from the project for a couple of years together. Uh, co-authored book. It's an interesting challenge to write uh, with another nine social scientists. Uh, a co-authored book that you're all happy with in the end, but uh, and we're still friends actually, so that's all good. Um, well, that's on the record now, so they won't be able to disagree with me. Um, and in one of the things that we did in that book was try and chart the emergence of new kinds of climate governance experimentation using Matthew Hoffman's formulation of the idea of governance experimentation more broadly than the idea of how cities are experimenting with climate governance in the way that I've used it in some of my more recent work to see what new forms of governing climate change were emerging internationally or transnationally. And that early peak that you can see is some business related initiatives but also the early city networks and you can see that that really levels off during the 1990s until the end of the 1990s and then through the 2000s where you have a kind of massive rise of different kinds of climate governance initiatives and effectively it was this second wave that kind of partly created by what cities were doing but also kind of gave life to a new wave of city climate action. In the paper that I mentioned, the retrospective by Michelle and I, um, published in uh, Environmental Politics, we call this new wave a wave of strategic urbanism. And we argue that climate change became a strategic issue for municipal governments, and indeed the city became a strategic arena for action for a range of other actors. So strategic urbanism relates both to how the urban became a strategic site for other actors to govern climate change and how climate change itself became a strategic issue for cities. Uh, Simon Marvin and Mike Hodson have also written about this idea of urban ecological security is starting to kind of dominate some economic and development agendas for cities and of course many other people here as well. But thinking about the way in which energy and climate change issues come to be kind of fundamental to strategies of economic growth and political reproduction in cities through the late 90, through the 2000s and into, into the 2010s. So what that means uh, in terms of transnational city work or new forms of city diplomacy as we see the development of specialist networks. So the networks during the 1990s were all highly generalized. They were all everything on climate change. In the, 1990, in the 2000s we saw uh, networks for big cities, networks for cities in the global south, networks on resilience, networks on greenhouse gas emissions. So we saw this diversity and specialization a growing interest in issues of climate change from large metropolitan areas such as London, uh, New York, Paris, as well as um, a growing interest of cities in the global south in these issues. And the engagement of multilateral donors and uh, the role of the private sector here. So very important kind of sets of new actors attracted to the idea of the city. And then just uh, three of the reports that were published at the end of the 2000s um, 
on from these organizations. So cities now position themselves by the late, by, you know, at the Copenhagen conference in 2009, cities start to position themselves as an alternative global response to that of the states. The Copenhagen conference ends in chaos, as you know, but cities stand up and say, we want you to recognize that the future of the globe will be won and lost in our cities, that we are uh, more able and we are more willing to act on climate change than any of the other actors you can see around the table. It's a bold move. Uh, with my students, I often ask them to discuss this quote and to think about whether they have heard anybody else say, please give me a really difficult challenge where there are no resources and a lot of political contestation. And how many other national governments have, have actually asked for more responsibility to act on climate change? and to think very carefully about why it is that cities position themselves in this way. It is, of course, to place themselves um, as indispensable in the political agenda, as a voice that cannot be ignored, and as an uh, act of strategic importance. This voice is then not only coming from municipalities, and hence the reason why we don't talk about this is a form of municipal voluntarism, but it's coming from a whole host of other, um, a whole host of other actors. So here, just four of the different kinds of actors that we can see in this form of new uh, climate cities diplomacy, the Rockefeller Foundation's Resilient Cities Program, supported, of course, by Rockefeller, a large philanthropic organization, C40 Cities, also underpinned by philanthropic funding, um, some uh, from individuals, some from uh, ethical investment funds, uh, maybe we can I'm sure Michele knows more about this than I do, uh, and he can maybe tell us more about where they get their money from later. It's always an interesting question to ask yourself to follow the money through these networks. Um, intrig one of the most intriguing for me was the uh, decision by the HSBC to focus on cities as part of their climate action partnership. So you have a large corporate actor thinking that the city is an important area for climate action, and some work um, by UN Habitat who is traditionally kept out of the climate change uh, arena until the last five or six years, where they too have started to work on climate change as well. So UN organizations, multilateral banks, donors, uh, banks, uh, private companies start to do this work. It has two, this uh, new diplomacy is taking place in the context of two different trends within climate governance. And it's also um, leading to substantiating them. The first is uh, what we can call, and indeed, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change call, uh, the Climate Governance Complex. This diagram is taken from the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report, Working Group 3, uh, Chapter 13, or something of this kind, um, where it tries to map out the ways in which climate governance is no longer done by the UNF Triple C, the um, the actor in the middle of the diagram, but it's being undertaken through all these other arenas at the same time. A second trend is that climate change is no longer being thought about as a single issue. So we no longer can think of climate change as an issue. It doesn't exist in that form anymore. If it did 25 years ago, I think we could say climate change was as, treated as a single issue 25 years ago. It is now a multiple issue. Um, I can talk about why that actually means that climate change is a very successful form of governance. Other people think that its dispersion means it's unsuccessful. I think its mobilization is a sign of its power, it's a sign of its success. But in the city's uh, world, we have at least the resilient city, the low carbon city, the smart city, the empowered city, multiple different ideas of the way in which one form of climate change is put together with a different kind of urban condition to create these sort of climate city multiple. So we've got a, a, a governance complex where different arenas are linked to one another to govern climate change in a kind of diffuse, it may appear fragmented way. There are actually links between all the different arenas. And at the same time, we have climate change as a problem not standing still, but moving into becoming multiple different problems at once. So. It's a very now complicated issue to govern, but that's also why cities are taking multiple different kinds of steps towards it. I'm just going to um, spend the last couple of minutes of my talk uh, 
suggesting that this is now this sort of forms of new diplomacy that we've seen, the rise of strategic urbanism, the range of different actors, coupled with the shifting landscape of climate governance, are leading to two trends within cities' responses to climate change, which I'll be interested to see whether my colleagues uh, speaking later today uh, share with me or, or see things uh, differently. Uh, one, I would argue, is experimentation. Some of you will know that I've been working on that for some time, and so I'm quite um, attached to this idea. But the other and possibly now more dominant trend is one of mainstreaming. So on the one hand, strategic urbanism and the kinds of transnational diplomacy that we saw configured experimentation as a mode of governance. And by that, I mean that the kinds of opportunities, capacities, resources that were available were often short-term, short-lived, project-focused, single issue, you know, build a new infrastructure there, get a pot of money to do a, a, a waste to energy plant here, lots of sort of short-term issues. And to be part of these networks, you have to continually replay what is best practice, continually innovate, continually be part of a, a growing kind of movement. So you're always kind of encouraged to be experimenting, even if you're doing something that hundreds of other cities have already done, you always think of it as innovation and uh, sort of the development of this kind of experimentation. On the other hand, the growing interest from mainstream climate actors, particularly over the last two or three years, as the United Nations Framework Convention re shifted its approach towards intended national, nationally determined contributions and needed to galvanize the action from private sectors and cities underneath that shift towards Paris, um, has led the United Nations Framework Convention to try and take over the city's agenda and also for cities to want more legitimacy from that agenda to try and effectively wear the clothes of that international agenda. So there is now a great deal of talk about the need for an IPCC for cities, the need for a solid scientific basis upon which to make uh, decisions. There's an emphasis on greenhouse gas emissions accounting, standardization, measurement, reporting and verification all of the different ways in which the climate, the language of the United Nations Framework Convention operates. The question is, of course, whether these two things pull in different directions. So here's just one example, a new uh, global standard for greenhouse gas emissions reporting that took three or four, maybe even longer to negotiate between all the different cities' networks, but is now trying to be used as a means of uh, consistently accounting for all emissions, uh, allowing good data to drive investment and uh, allowing cities' contributions to be recorded under national contributions. The NASCAR, um, the non-state action zone for, well, yes, uh, for climate action, um, which records all of the different initiatives being undertaken by private sectors and by cities. Uh, cities are a very big part of NASCAR, which is now part of the United Nations Framework Convention apparatus. These things have been driven by a kind of trend of, of experimentation in governance, but there's a question about whether this sort of standardization and reporting of verification will actually mean that many of the things which have excited cities, have galvanized action, have brought together different actors on the ground in cities, or the different sorts of sometimes relatively ephemeral experiments which are hard to count, whether they can still thrive in that condition of more standardization. An alternative approach and one that I was part of at United Nations Habitat was to try to, rather than kind of creating blueprints and standards for action, was to create a set of common principles that cities could adopt and then develop their climate change action as they would wish to. Whether this will, this is in some senses a counter trend uh, whether from the UN Habitat's perspective it's in order to try and create space for cities in the global south because the kinds of standardization, reporting, measurement, verification, knowledge requirements that are being asked for are very onerous for cities with few resources. So this is a kind of alternative approach to create a sort of platform where cities can adopt one or more of these principles and show that they're part of a global initiative and show that they are doing good governance without having to adopt all of the kind of relatively bureaucratically, administratively heavy and resource intensive processes that you might be required to do from a more standardized process. So um, I think, yeah, to just finish with, um, 
having worked in this field for such a long time, I, you know, I tend to be a very positive person in general, and I tend to feel that you know, it, it's, it, it's difficult not to be positive if you start off by thinking, well, like 25 years ago, there were sort of 14 cities doing something on climate change, and now there are more than 7,400. That seems like a good thing, and I think it is a good thing. Um, and to see and to have been you know, part of that sort of emergence of the urban response is indeed very gratifying. Of course, it doesn't mean that what is happening now is enough or sufficient or that there aren't challenges. And so I always think it's important for us to consider what the elephants in the room are, indeed the elephants rampaging around several cities. Um, actually, existing climate change work at the city level is still very piecemeal and fragmented. And the extent to which carbon reductions are taking place and resilience measures being put into place, oh, you know, we still don't really know because evaluation and effectiveness are not... Uh, things that it's easy to do as researchers, and they're not things that city governments often want to do. There's still limited attention given to questions of uneven development and climate justice within the city. So it will be really interesting to think about that in relationship to the case studies that we see later. How often are we talking about what a city should do around climate change rather than what different groups within the city have a responsibility to do? So if you take a city like Paris or a city like London and we say we want to have massive decarbonisation in those cities. Well, you know, whose responsibility in that city is it? Does everybody reduce their emissions by the same amount or do some of us bear more responsibility than others? Those of us who are wealthier rather than those who are poorer, those of us who have more capacity than those who don't. I mean, that is what our international principles on climate change tell us, but it's not what we apply to the city. The future orientation, we can be very utopian about what cities who address climate change will look like in the future. Almost everybody is always smiling who lives in those cities. I don't know if you've noticed that on those nice little cartoons. There's always children playing and balloons being flown, and it's always very beautiful to look at. But this future orientation means that we don't often stop to think, what do we have to not do in the city anymore? What do we have to undo? How do we undo carbon from our day-to-day -day life? And still questions around embodied carbon, for example, in, in concrete and our new building practices in cities, and our practices of consumption and global trade remain generally off limits. I've finished now. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot to be on time. Um, do we hear Claire, or do we take some questions just now? Uh, Olivier? Maybe you can have a, a few. short question if you have uh, are uh, requesting additional information or clarification and then we, we can have a more general discussion after uh, Claire Rume's speech. So if someone would like to ask a specific question, yeah, Nathalie Blanc. <coughs> Seems to work. Well, thanks for your talk. I very much uh, I read already your paper, so I, I know a bit of, of your work. I was just wondering how you analyze this schizophrenia between the high rising consumption of carbon in cities and this structuration of uh, these networks. I mean, you're just touching it at the end of your talk, and I would. I would be curious about the framework of analysis of this different path, because it seems more general in the field of environmental issues, the schizophrenia running on. Sure. I, I, I'm not sure that we can actually say that carbon is rising rapidly in all cities around the world, because we have many different we have many different trends happening. So you have some cities in which, uh, so if you take energy supply is a significant part of where carbon comes from. Um, you have many cities which are moving to quite low carbon forms of energy now, um, not, only in the, not only in the north, but also in the global south. The question around consumption and our consumption of carbon, that itself is also interesting, and I think it's highly varied. Um, if you look at consumption of, of greenhouse, if you look at consumption-based accounting of greenhouse gas emissions, you'll find that agriculture is about a third. And so it's really about diet and food. 
Um, so, you, but you do see some groups of the population going to much more vegetarian diets in some parts of cities, and you know it's about food waste and those kind of issues as well. And there are lots of different kinds of initiatives cropping up around food sharing and food waste and so on. So that's one set of issues. Um, if you're looking at other forms of embodied carbon, you're really looking at the, the material flow through the built environment. So you're looking at concrete and steel. Um, and again, there you see some different trends in the building sector. In some places, you're going for uh, what are called modern methods of, con of construction, so prefabricated housing, and you can really reduce uh, the material imprint of housing if you use those methods. So I think. Uh, Effectively, there are multiple different trends going on. The com combination in different cities we just don't really have a clear picture of. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, there are forms of consumption based emissions accounting that you can use, um, but they're very rarely used and they're certainly not used by any of the networks that we're talking about today. If there are no more clarification questions, then maybe we can turn to Claire Rume's presentation. You can oh, you come back for the discussion. I'll come back. I'll yeah. come back. Don't worry. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Um, thank you for inviting me. I will have a slightly different point of view than the one expressed before, obviously, because uh, I am director of one of those network, uh, city network. It's a European city network, although we have members a little bit all around. We are really, really, really based in, in Europe. Energy Cities has been created 25 years ago, the same year than Climate Alliance, the same year than ECLE uh, Global. Mainly, these uh, networks have been created for um, having a say or, or in, at the Rio conference. So it's really Rio who started the, the Climate uh, Cities Network uh, and they have been building on uh, their own strengths along the years in between from one COP to another for the one that we're really concentrating on the different uh, COP, uh, main, mainly ECLE uh, in that time. And uh, for energy cities, what we concentrated on was mainly European policies. So what we tried is to really try to uh, foster the exchange of cities on their energy policy, mostly, not so much on climate, um, helping with the, uh, on the, with the help of the European programs. For example, I don't know if you know, but one of the big programs of the European Union was uh, 15 years ago to create energy agency. So to give the money for getting, having energy agency at local level and in many regions there is still a lot of energy agency. These have been built by the EU uh, with the EU support. So our focus always has been the EU policy. Now what I have been uh, asked to talk is about the global covenant. What is the global covenant, where it's coming from? So I will more not give you any analysis because it's not my job, it's your job. But what I will do is uh, tell you the story and also ask your help actually because uh, I'm not entirely sure we will manage the merger of the two different initiatives that are, have been the two legs of the Global Covenant on which I will just tell you the story. Uh, and tomorrow we have what we call the first uh, Founders Council, so it's all cities network uh, the main ones, the main city net networks that are active under the Compact of Mayors and the, global, the Covenant of Mayors that will meet tomorrow to decide what is the Global Covenant. Because for the moment we have launched it, we have announced it, we have communicated on it, but nobody ever uh, decided or discussed none of those networks what it is, uh, what is the Global Covenant. And I think for me one of the key kind of tension we have now in the climate, so-called cities diplomacy in climate issues, is that uh, cities network are very highly instrumentalized and that now we can barely speak about the city diplomacy. A lot of people can say that they, they are representing cities. Uh, your example, uh, just of the Rockefeller Foundation having the resilient cities network and so on. But basically everybody wants to have its own cities network doing climate diplomacy. And they finance it in a way or another, and it's, they, they are trying to find a focus, and they put a stamp on political um, commitment behind, but I 
from being inside, I, I think it's, there is a kind of a fake news over there. So that's uh, something it's, that it worries me a lot, which I will discuss with my counterparts. So, for example, to, tonight, actually, we have a dinner with Ikle, uh, um, global director, because we want to, to see what can we do in that kind of context where actually uh, cities... Um, uh, um, how we, uh, cities' uh, weight is used more than uh, being uh, actually a support for getting uh, stronger policy. So now I'll come back. How much time do you uh, give me? Sorry. Enough. I, okay, <coughs> that's okay. 20, 20, 25 minutes. Okay, because the story is long, but I can do it short. I mean, it's really you depending. Don't, and don't have a presentation, by the way. No, 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 because actually this is not. Yeah. Okay. okay. So. Now, the Global Covenant, it's the merger of two initiatives. From one side, the EU Covenant of Mayors, and from the other side, the Global Compact of Mayors. The story behind is that the, in 2008, so in uh, 2008, the EU Covenant of Mayors has been launched in EU. Why it's called covenant? What does it mean, covenant? Covenant means a contract. It's a contract between cities and EU institution. It's a partnership. That's the idea of it, the main philosophy of it, and it's extraordinarily important because today that's exactly the reason why we don't manage to find a, gr a common ground to do the merger. It's because it has been conceived as a contract in between cities agreeing to take their share, to take their part into an EU policy. And at that time, the EU policy was the one that the EU managed to get an agreement in on uh, with the 28 member states for Copenhagen. And this agreement was, in 2020, we will reduce by 20% our greenhouse gas emission, we will increase by 20% our renewable energy uh, capacity, or the renewable energy capacity will be 20% of our energy mix, and we will have reduced our energy need by increasing energy efficiency by 20%. It was a very ambitious package. I mean, that was the only ambitious package that was put on the table of Copenhagen. And in that context, City said, has been asked by the Commission in a way, because it's a Commission who really came with the idea at the very first step. And then the, this idea was shared with EU cities network main networks like your cities or the UCLG, so the Union of Local Government uh, uh, European branch called CMR, EuroCities, which is the biggest cities in EU, but it's a, it's a network of cities which is uh, very generalist, and uh, Energy Cities and Climate Alliance, and Federen also for the regions. So the, this is a partnership, it's, it's a proposal of an initiative to launch this initiative, uh, from the Commission to the Cities Network, the Cities Network saying this is a great idea because it really uh, shows that there is a partnership and we need a direct link. We need a direct um, uh, yeah, link in between EU institutions and the local action on climate and energy. Although, because mainly the energy transition will be decentralized. And if you want to go on something which is a very ambitious energy policy, given the kind of energy systems we have in Europe, which was at that time extraordinarily centralized, still unbundled, which now is, uh, I mean, there is, uh, has been some liberalization directives since then, but at that time it was very, very centralized. So the idea was, yes, we get on with the local authorities at any level, little villages, big cities, uh, any, any uh, or uh, a group of, of, commu, commu, uh, of local authorities can also be uh, signatories of this covenant. To be signatories of the covenant, so the covenant is a partnership, you take uh, uh, your, your, your partner to the EU institution that will try to help you to reach the 20% uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2020. Of course, this, was, this has been designed as a way to just mobilize at, the, at first but uh, it was completely, uh, the, the success of it showed that it feed a need in terms of new kind of governance on EU policy. Today, there is uh, 7,000 signatories in the, Europe, in the covenant of, of, um, of 
the Covenant of Mayors EU. It represents a third of the EU population, is covered by a city who has signed. It has been uh, already um, upgraded three times. So uh, we first had an upgrade with uh, a new, um, so just to come back on the process, the process is that you go to the, your city council, you get a city council decision uh, to commit. Then you, you do a baseline inventory emission, a baseline uh, emission inventory, then you do an action plan, then you do a monitoring plan, and all this is supposed to do with the stakeholders. And you have this kind of circle, which is now also the case in the compact, but at the beginning it was not, but now it's also the case in the compact. So this is a kind of iterative policy, which is also very important, because it never ends. You always have to come back, in a way, to the first uh, step. And so now we have a pillar on adaptation, before it was only on mitigation. There is also a pillar which, is, which has to be developed and is absolutely not developed, and there is no research done on that, to help us on how can we put a pillar on access to energy, affordable energy. So actually the, the, the main... Um, challenge that um, you uh, proposed, uh, Ariad, before on the inclusiveness of energy and climate policy at local level. This is something that actually is supposed to be a pillar and is not yet de defined and uh, that, that needs to be defined at some point. So this is the first one. And then the, the second, uh, basically, upgrade is to have a global dimension. The global dimension before the merger with the compact of mayors, which I will come back now, is, has been designed internally in the Commission and it was uh, done as uh, a way to mobilize, uh, to, to do not city diplomacy, but to really do a kind of a alignment of development and cooperation policies with the climate agenda. So the instruments that the European Commission is using to uh, finance and support the globalization of the covenant is a, a, a cooperation and development instrument financing. It's called the foreign policy instrument and the Commission has, is financing today eight regional uh, offices of the covenant which are supposed to develop their own covenant, their own uh, regional way of uh, this, uh, doing the, the, the same movement, meaning that they have to be, it's a covenant, so it means that they have to develop partnerships with n n the regional level, so in Latin America it can be with Mercosur, or it can be in, in Asia it has to be with governments, in Africa it, it, the, the Union, um, uh, the African Union is, it should, can be involved, or it has to be done with government, but the idea is, is it it is a partnership. So it, it started to finance it in Eastern Europe as a way to uh, mobilize cities in uh, all the different, Eastern Europe meaning Far East, I mean, um, Kiev, uh, Belarusia, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, um, all those countries that are neighborhood policy, neighborhood countries of the EU, they have their own covenant since now five years. In that case, as for the EU, uh, Energy Cities is responsible and coordinating the consortium of all EU cities network who is, are implementing the Secretariat. And we are the coordinators of both contract with the, with, the, with, the, with the Commission. In Ukraine, it was amazingly uh, successful. In all those countries, it's amazingly successful because there is a potential also to have uh, access to funds and cities are eager to find a, a, a framework to, to really uh, design their climate action. It, it really offers a very simple framework for cities to uh, design their climate action. Now there is so one office in uh, Rio, one office in uh, Mexico, one office in Accra, one office in India, where I don't know where, one office in China, one an office in Tokyo, no, it's not, well, whatsoever, in Japan, um, one office in Kiev, one office in Brussels. So these are the offices of the regional covenants that are now being launched a year ago and that will start to develop their own covenant at a regional level. Now come the compact. So 
This to, to explain a little bit the, the different upgrades. So there is an upgrade on, on different regions, so the outreach, but it's an outreach which is a very special outreach because it's a commission, who, the European Commission, who, who wants to support cities' action for climate, but it's part of their uh, business diplomacy or business outreach. I don't know how we could call, call it. It's, it's, it's embedded into their own, uh, in the embassy, in the EU embassy. This is where the, the, the offices are dealt with. Um, to come back on the, com on the compact, the compact has a very, very different origin. The origin of the compact is uh, that uh, the UN has been um, developing a compact for business around 2010 to try to mobilize and cre create a critical mass of business leaders who says, yes, climate is important. You need to have climate action. So it was really the UN, it's Ban Ki-moon, creating the compact for business. And it's a compact is not a partner. It, it's not a partnership. A compact is a, it's a commitment. It's you, you commit and, and then you can measure it. That's very important. It's by, by that with the principal aim to create the critical mass. And it, I think it, it didn't fail. At the contrary, it was very successful in showing the critical mass for business leaders. Now we know that all the big companies have very, very ambitious climate uh, change uh, um, uh, targets, or some of them have at, at least. And cities are also committed a lot uh, towards the same kind of approach, which is about uh, having a, a bold commitment, measurable, very important to be uh, the, the, me the measurement of this uh, commitment, and it can be by action. Now, the compact is also the, the, the circle of iterative action, where you just first look at your potential and then you, 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 you give your own target. What is very important is for the covenant, you don't give your target. The target is the EU one. The target is the collective one. And we believe that it's why it has been successful. It's because you, you, it's because you, you embed a city action into a much more broader agenda and uh, in a collective target which is a political target. And the compact f for, for us, in that case the EU cities le uh, networks, it, this is where it felt actually because it doesn't give a target to reach and it's normal because it's global. So at global level cities cannot have the same targets. So that, that's the reason why it's very normal but that's the, the kind of a uh, limit of the of the um, of the approach. This is why now what has been agreed for doing the merger is that cities have to commit to this, at least the same target than there is in their NDCs in their national uh, contribution. So, because for us this is really what is super important in the future of the covenant. It has it has no mean or it, it it's it's. We, we are already beyond mobilization. Mobilization of cities, of course, we still need to do it. I mean, it's not, but it's in a way the step of yesterday. The step of tomorrow is going much beyond and it's, it's really building on a very strong multi-level governance approach so that indeed the energy and climate policies are really decentralized and, and that we, we, we come into the art core of the economy, the art core of the energy system, and that's where we believe the covenant um, uh, challenge is. It's not, and the mobilization will continue, hopefully, but it's not, uh, I would say, be, because of Paris and because it, it has been so successful so far, uh, it's not so much of the, the main general challenge of the future, I would say. So, <clears throat> That's the different approaches. What, what is uh, now the link in between um, this initiative and the cities network? Because obviously it's kind of a schizophrenic all the time. Because we are a cities network, we represent um, uh, uh, cities and uh, we, want, we all want our part of light and visibility on the arena and we fight a lot. This is uh, an, an awful war, but uh, at the same time we know that this, co this global covenant is actually also the opportunity to have one single strong voice. 
So we recognize that it's, an, it's important that the forest, we have insisted a lot in EU that the global covenant or the EU covenant is not a network, it's an initiative. It's a joint initiative by cities network and the European Commission. And this is why, and it stays like that. Although it is very political, the, the EU covenant as a political board it's, uh, this political board is um, composed by one mayor of each of the cities' networks, so it's six mayors that are compo compo composing, or six cities composing the, 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 the political board, and this political board meets with the commissioner directly. The next meeting, uh, it's the EU political board, will meet with the commissioner, Arias Cagnete, who is responsible for energy and climate, on the 20th of June, because Arias Cagnete wants to have mayors um, support in launching a very ambitious, mo what they call mobility package, but it's, ma it's mainly uh, electrical ve vehicle everywhere. So that, that this kind of dialogue, this is what, what we wanted the covenant to be for. It's a direct dialogue between what can be done in the city and, and a partnership with the European Commission. Um, <clears throat> In this schizophrenia, uh, there is different agenda. The thing is that for the COP21, I have seen that all cities network had a kind of a same agenda. We want to be extremely bold and visible. And for the moment, we stay on that agenda. And as I explained before, I think it's, it's for me, we are, we are not an, enough ambitious if we only want to have this visibility and we have no specific uh, um, uh, further requests than being visible and being heard. It, I think this is, uh, the, we, we are missing uh, the, the potential of the initiative, which is a po political potential much bigger than, than that. C40 is running its own way, because C40 is big enough. C40 represents uh, 100 uh, of the biggest city of the world, and they have a very uh, aggressive, I will, um, it's, uh, it's gentle, I mean, it's not uh, negative, but they, have, they are very uh, ambitious in what they want to do with their members' cities, that they have to develop uh, what they call the 2020 deadline report, and in their 2020 deadline report, each of the city will present exactly how they will arrive to the carbon neutrality. And so the, 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 the momentum now for the C40 uh, uh, cities is to really build on this uh, very strong and ambitious plan around the 2020 deadline. For ICLE, and this is good, because, I mean, this is good, I don't know if it's good or wrong, but the, I think this is needed at least because it, it shows that in 2020, we, you need to be very ambitious already now and you need to have clear plans and it shows the way. So they are kind of a, an exclusive club of uh, very ambitious cities, not open at all to others because uh, they want to have a restricted membership to, to, to 100 uh, because that's what attracts actually the funds and the questions about who is funding what is extraordinarily important. You really need to dig on that because it's, mm, it's not good. <laughs> I think it's very, very tricky, very tricky. Um, ICLE has another uh, agenda. The agenda of ICLE is to continue to be a part and, and becoming an, uh, a real actor, almost like a party, in the UN processes. But not only for them, but really representing all the local authorities. Because they do, what they do is a coordination of what we call the LGMA, I don't even know what, a local government uh, major uh, group or what's, well, they do coordinate that and they do it very well and they make sure that there is a, a strong s local um, uh, leaders summit each time there is a COP and I think it's important that there is some milestone like that and that's, that's the role they chose for the moment. And for other networks like uh, more European networks, here then our agenda is a little bit different because it's, more, it's less on, on, the, on the global one. So finally, um, what I, I see is that um, so the, the, the merger is not done because for the moment we are completely and I have just looked at in, in the train at the documents that we will have for tomorrow um, 
for, for discussion about what is the global covenant and it only shows that we have for the moment completely different definitions of what it should be. And some say that the global covenant is a way to tell cities what to do and to urge cities to fill in the reporting system and otherwise they are not part and to make sure that there is a very top-down um, way of, 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 of standardizing everything, the reporting system, the standard, the, 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 um, all the data, uh, access to data is very tricky and what cities has to do it, with the idea that uh, we will show uh, big numbers and if we show big numbers we will be taken seriously so for me it's something that is already from the past but okay that's what is supposed to be one of the main goal of the global covenant and the second thing is that they what they want is to uh, have access to finance so they want to facilitate because of the data and because of the standardization of uh, emission inventory on the on the territory they want to basically sell packages to the um, international financial institution, which it's, they already do. They, they are very, it's very heavy on that. You, you, you have to know, for example, that to fill in the, the, the GPC that you were presenting, uh, there is two different models, the CDP or the carbon registry. And for filling this kind of thing, you need uh, for, for a city like uh, uh, Athens, for example, um, Bloomberg Philanthropy paid two people during six months to be in Athens, inside the local authority council, to fill in those data, because most of the data don't exist. So this is very intensive, and that's even paid directly by the philanthropies for big cities, because what they want is to show the, the, the data. So th that's uh, one side, and the other side is, is, is uh, us who wants to really try to do the same model that we have seen that has been successful for, so far, meaning that we have a very, very, very regional-based uh, covenant. So it's really about mobilizing actors either at a national level, when it's very big, like in, in Brazil, it doesn't make sense to have it in Latin America, or it does, but it's, it, differ, it differs. And to build on with all stakeholders at national level or regional level, and from there, and, and it can be very different in the different regions, and from that diversity, we build strengths because the diversity means that you are adapted to your ecosystem. Okay, I mean, I'm not going to, to go uh, very long on that because it's already, uh, I will finish there. But the, of, of course, I mean, it, it's, it looks like uh, white and, and, and black, and actually it is. So I'm very uh, grateful if you have any idea of how to match those two, uh, mm -hmm. because that's the, what we are supposed to do tomorrow <laughs> morning. Um, but I'm starting, we, we have been doing a lot of, I haven't talked about who is behind all the time because um, in, the, in the merger, for example, it's really Bloomberg and it's Bloomberg himself. So it's, it's a person, it's a person who is putting on the money for two years to do that merger and then the secretariat that will be built during those two years. So it's actually, it's around 10 millions for the two years. And it's only about secretariat people, so it's people building on a structure so that after we can speak on behalf of the cities. So to finish about the, the different tensions that we have to solve and also the challenges I see for cities network, there is the first one about diversity of uh, approaches versus standardization, and this is very big. And of course, it looks a little bit like uh, Europe versus America, but it is actually, I mean, concretely, uh, it's, it's a way. However, however, uh, it's also about, um, I don't see any neutrality in who is behind each time. It's, it's, it, I, I don't want to, to, to be like, a, to play the, the devil advocate till the end, but the European Commission has something to gain in it. What they want is to sell some of their technology and being the one selling technologies for uh, smart uh, uh, climate neutral cities in the, in the future. And that's why they are putting the money. That's, that's the reason behind. 
then of course there is a different approach, an approach of involving all stakeholders uh, and the standardization approach uh, from Boom Bloomberg, uh, which is uh, heavily supported by C40 and Nucle Global, is also about uh, uh, making sure that uh, cities first hacked, but also that they are becoming some kind of a sizable market so that it helps uh, the kind of clean growth to, to be um, rolling out. Then there is a big tension about stakeholders and multi-level governance, this kind of centralized way or decentralized way of looking at the initiative. There is also a tension in between this kind of obligation, obligatory system, you have to report or something which is much more about you have to commit and, and you have to, to, to uh, talk with your stakeholders. And of course, in behind, there is uh, something in between the tension between big cities and smaller cities, because this still is only possible for cities very wealthy, and it doesn't make any sense uh, for other cities. So what the Rockefeller Foundation or the uh, Bloomberg Foundation or other foundations are doing, they are actually paying consultants to be in cities, in Accra, for example, or in, uh, in uh, Cape Town, which is not... Uh, supposed to be super poor, to do the reporting and to plan, to do the planning, to do the climate action planning. So that's for me a problem. Then I believe that uh, we need, as, EU, as cities network, uh, we were uh, very uh, successful in the past in, in bringing on the agenda, in being a new actor, in, uh, in, in putting a lot of dynamism and uh, positivism, posit positivism into uh, some processes which are very locked in. Uh, but today, I feel that we are highly instrumentalized, uh, very highly, and that actually mayors are very annoyed, very, very annoyed. Uh, you can't almost speak about any uh, local leaders that really think that the EU net uh, cities networks are or today um, good, a good thing, only the ones that are in elected in it because they speak on behalf, it's finished, because they, they speak on behalf. Those uh, new initiatives, they speak on behalf of cities, uh, of mayors, of elected people, and we see that now there is a kind of a blooming uh, moment of new networks, new or new initiatives, like uh, Barcelona, for example, is organizing in two weeks' time the Fearless Cities Symposium. And it's supposed to be, because they want to get ownership again. And I think it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Uh, for Cities Network, we need to really reflect on it, but it's a very good thing. And um, yeah, that, that's why for, for me, my only priority is to make those in, this initiative, the Global Covenant, but the EU Covenant too, and our networks much more political again. Because that's only if we are really serious about uh, being representing representing cities by not speaking on behalf of mayors, but letting the mayors to speak by themselves, that we will solve this, uh, this issue. Voilà. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, very interesting and very helpful. And, uh, and contrary to tradition, you have questions for the audience, whereas usually <laughs> It's the other way around, but it's fine. I'm sure the experts in the audience will be glad to discuss the issues you raise. So we have a half an hour or so of uh, uh, discussion after these two presentations, and we'll have a short break to arrange the uh, Skype uh, communication with Jeff Brugman in New York, and, um, and hopefully it will work out well. We're not sure. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the two presentations that I find highly interesting and stimulating. I have a first question for Ayat. Um, I'm very interested to know more about uh, the driving forces that are behind the strategic urbanism that you mentioned, that is like a, a sort of turning point into the way the intercity deals with climate change. And you are highlighting the fact that the that economic growth and security has become a strategic issue, and you mentioned the, the increasing role of the private sector. So I wanted to know uh, whether, uh, what about the whole 
uh, what do you include in the private sector? Do you also include grassroots movement, activism, social mobilization? And how far does that kind of movements also play a role in the shifting ways of dealing with climate change? And also maybe they could also help us linking it with one of the strategic issues that you highlight in the conclusion about not enough attention being paid to climate justice and, uh, and um, environmental inequality. So I'm just trying to link up those uh, kind of set of actors that might be uh, driving the agenda with perhaps more uh, different viewpoints and uh, maybe taking um, issues forward in terms of uh, social mobilization and uh, social justice. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That, that is indeed a big question um, so, and has lots of different elements. I think, I mean, in, in, in many ways, the, it, it does echo some of the points that were also made when we heard about the realities of trying to govern uh, cities' networks on the ground. Um, part of the point of my talk was that the city has become a strategic arena for action for many different other actors and in a sense that's why it is that you feel perhaps for, that the mayor's voices are becoming lower and that the city networks are being pulled into many different directions by whether it's the European Commission in their funding or by philanthropists. So the idea of strategic urbanism is on the one hand that cities became a site where multiple different kinds of actors saw the potential for taking action. Um, so that was it was a driver from, if you like, outside cities. So development agencies, uh, the UN uh, habitat itself, um, but also national governments in various different places saw the city as a place which they needed to enrol in order to be able to say anything positive about climate change. Perhaps because the, it's easier to sell some forms of win-win solution at an urban scale. You know, you can address climate change and clean the air, or you can, this idea of co-benefits that cities had been marketing themselves throughout the 1990s became um, sort of the, the fuel into that. Uh, on the other hand, then you saw uh, cities themselves putting climate change into a strategic issue, partly because of the changing nature of the European Union's energy commitments in the in the way that we just heard about that um, there became an idea that there could be new forms of green economy or green market available through new technologies or through developing new sectors of the economy like the renewable energy sector but partly also because of the idea of climate change posing a risk to key industrial sectors or key economic sectors so particularly the finance sector um, some very interesting work by a woman called Sarah Knuth, who's in uh, California at the moment, although she's just about to join my department in Durham, so I'm very pleased about that. But she also looked at how, during the housing uh, crisis in the U US, the uh, financing, which had been in sort of mainstream housing, came into green buildings. So that you've got some footloose capital looking for investment return and green buildings became a space for return. So that's a very complicated area and I don't really know much about it, although I know people are starting to look at how has the green economy actually been built, where have those flows of finance come from, what were they doing previously and how did they get redirected. So you can see investment from the private sector into a kind of green economy as, uh, as a means of making money when other things weren't so available. So, Sorry, that was quite long, but there's quite a lot of different things going on there. There's also the rise of the whole notion of the smart city and the idea of a lot of high-tech companies regarding the city as the next kind of frontier for their economies like IBM and Google and so on and so forth. So that's another kind of push there. Um, so yeah, uh, confluence. Um, in terms of how it links to the question of the grassroots movements, Yes, I think during the 2000s you also see a set of grassroots movements, particularly transition towns, of course, um, but some other uh, community energy projects coming into cities. So networks of community energy action in the UK are quite strong. I, I don't know the situation in other countries as well as it's only the UK that I've done research on that. Um, but they, the urban becomes an arena to kind of develop alternative forms of resourcing, distributed generation, community-based action, and also food sharing projects as well. So you do have that. So again, the urban becomes an arena through which to realize particular political ambitions, although those ambitions are different from the private sector ones we talked about. There are some interesting questions about environmental justice there, because many of those campaigns are also thought to target relatively affluent middle-class groups of city residents, and not really to have engaged those who are the most marginal in terms of access to energy. 
through it or to access to food. So the link between sort of community renewables and, and fuel poverty, which in the UK is a very significant issue, is, is not strong. So community-based renewable energy projects are not often used to address access to energy. So that's, that's a challenge, yeah? So it's not that the grassroots innovations and social movements are targeting questions of climate justice where the private sector ones aren't. It's more a question that, I mean, we can look at climate justice in two ways. We can look at access, who has access to, to kind of modern electricity or energy services, as is in the Sustainable Development Goal, which is why it's now become a third pillar in the, the way that we're talking about. But we can also look at justice in terms of how far responsibilities are being taken. So how far are more affluent groups within society being responsible for reducing their emissions by more than other groups? How far are the private sector actors in any one city taking more action than others. Um, so it's two ways. So. Nathalie? I always have questions. That's why he's smiling. So that's good. I, was, I, I just have two questions. First uh, uh, to Claire. Uh, I was wondering, you were talking about the schizophrenia at the beginning, I'm going back to this question, uh, because cities are feeling uh, I instrumentalized, you say, uh, meaning, does it change something to climate issues that cities are instrumentalized? Is it good for climate politics, nonetheless? I mean, you could say, yes, we are instrumentalized, but it's good for climate politics, so whatsoever. Or uh, is it just a question of image or something like that? In which case, I mean, the fact that these networks are being built is, is, is not doing much for the climate itself. So that's just uh, one question. And the other question is about, I am part of this uh, new alliance about uh, climate and nature-based solutions, you know, the one with... Uh, which was uh, in funded by uh, Cynthia Rosweig in New York City. And uh, we talk ab a lot about nature-based solutions, not only about energy solutions, meaning the way that grassroots are uh, grasping this issue of climate justice is more based on what they can do through nature-based solutions. So I was wondering how you tackling these issues. Thank you. But by answering your second question, then you have the answer of the first one. Actually, does it make, uh, is it important to make sure that uh, the, is it good for climate that networks or cities are instrumentalized or not? I believe that when you uh, take out the ownership of the action and the ownership of the decision to any group actually, then you completely uh, cut the capaci their capacity to adapt, their capacity of resilience, their capacity to create, their capacity to react. And actually, today, it's not energy that will be the problem, because energy we see on the energy market, very soon we can have a climate neutral energy system, very soon, if we want. Of course, I mean, very soon takes always ages, but still, the, the, everything is possible. The problem is what kind of, if it would be enough, and we all agree to say that on climate issue, we need to change the way we work, we live, we need to change the culture, and that was your last point on the, in terms of challenge, is what in the city you need to undo. So if uh, climate, uh, if all the cities network are instrumentalized and that actually there, there is no uh, ownership of the initiative, you cut their capacity to uh, be more than only uh, 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 a change of, of technology, basically. Changing technology is possible if you instrumentalize. We can be instrumentalized it all, but it won't change the culture, and the culture has to be done uh, by the cities, and that's why you need to empower. So it is a major, major, major challenge. And for, for, for what I witnessed now, and it's, it's, on, it's only my point of view, it's really uh, nothing shared with, uh, is that for me, the current uh, way of philanthropy to act on the city uh, diplomacy, on city action on climate, is counterproductive. 
and is actually damaging the climate. And uh, okay, I'm happy if I can, in a way, one day uh, tell that to their funders, but. Uh, Thank you. Um, Olivia, would you indulge me by putting my last slide up again? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank right. you. Um, in, and in the meantime, I just on this question of the centralized uh, or an, an instrumentalized approach, I mean, Bloomberg has always had this kind of catchphrase. There we go, that's fine. Um, whether, you know, you have to be able to measure it to manage it. That actually has been part of ICLEI's approach for the last 20 years as well. But the problem, and uh, you know, as you said, uh, there is no evidence that that is true. Um, there's no evidence that if you spend your resources counting how many greenhouse gas emissions you're producing in a very detailed fashion, you will take any better policy. It's based on the idea that knowledge informs policy, that if you have perfect knowledge, you'll have perfect policy, but we uh, probably know that that isn't right. We also have very good estimates of where greenhouse gas emissions come from in cities uh, in a ballpark figure to be able to kind of say, okay, these are the sorts of actions that will get us towards where we want to go to without having to do a very elaborate measurement verification process. So you, if there are only so many resources in the world, you have to decide how you're going to spend them. So you can either spend them counting stuff and making yourself more legitimate, or, or you can spend them taking action on the ground and supporting the kinds of grassroots actions that you're saying or <laughs> building new infrastructures. I mean, I, th I think I would say to Claire that there is a, a, a third way to risk um, sounding too much like Thank a UK you. politician, but that, that both the centralized and the distributed models that you mentioned really rely on an idea of planning first and acting second. But much of action on the ground is the other way around, it's acting first and planning second, which, which may seem contradictory, but it is part of, of a kind of an approach that we witness a lot now in terms of governing environmental issues in general, which we call government by experimentation. That you trial things out, you experiment, you gather momentum, political support by doing things first, and then you see how successful they've been, and you abandon things that haven't worked. And that kind of mode of government by experiment, the cities or groups that seem to be most successful in, and maintain momentum around climate change have a sense that they are able to try things out without the fear of failure or without needing to account for them too closely to start with. So that's maybe a third way. Um, on nature-based solutions, I'm just, uh, I need the other one actually, the very last one. With the, there's, a nice, there's a nice flower logo on it, you see, it's my new, it's my new project. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm leading a consortium funded by the Commission on Nature-Based Solutions. Um, which we just started, and hopefully the web page will be launched this week. But yeah, it's called Naturevation, Nature-Based Urban Innovation, and we're interested in the politics surrounding nature-based solutions for addressing climate change so, um, and other issues. So if anybody wants to talk to me about nature-based solutions, please do so. Thanks. <laughs> yes, uh, but interestingly, the city has disappeared in the word naturevation, or is it the ur of urban? Okay, but it's, yeah. So it's well hidden, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. And then the subtitle. Um, I had two related questions for both of you, I guess. Uh, one is about this uh, uh, adaptation agenda, which uh, gets more important now. Does it make a difference in how um, climate policies are... Um, <clears throat> develop and are uh, supported uh, uh, within uh, urban societies or, or does it make no difference? Is it, is it a, a different area or related area or does it support the rest or, uh, or hinder it or whatever? And, the, um, <clears throat> and my other question which is I think related is, uh, is there already um, uh, a visible outcome of climate action and experiments in other uh, uh, urban policy areas. You mentioned, uh, well, obviously energy, that's clear enough, but food and transport and housing and, and so my, uh, well, in a way the answer yes is obvious, but my question is uh, how are this articulation thought about in order to uh, support the climate policy objectives? For example, if you look at energy policy, which I agree is different from looking at climate uh, policy. But if you look at local energy policy, you see that um, they, they are also very uh, uh, piecemeal in a way, but uh, 
um, uh, successes are uh, often related to when energy policy is related to, for example, economic development or other kinds of policies. And we may criticize that or um, discuss its limitations. But on the other hand, it's also a fuel for, for these policies to, to move forward. So I was wondering if there was something similar in, in, in climate policies, because I, I would agree with your, uh, uh, one of your uh, conclusions that the achievements so far are, are uh, limited in piecemeal, and, and, and so we have to find a way out of it. So, anyway. Okay, first. Um, on adaptation, I think you know one of the other moves that you can see in the kind of emergence of strategic urbanism is the bringing in of adaptation into the kind of arena, and they're in some senses using that agenda to enrol cities in the global south. And there are some politics there also about how far then those cities joined particular networks on the promise of addressing questions of adaptation and resilience and have now become charged with emissions reductions in a sense that kind of disrupts some of the normal international politics about who should be responsible for greenhouse gas emissions. So if we're asking cities like uh, Accra and Cape Town to reduce emissions while well, we're not doing so well ourselves. How does that you know, look? So that, there's a kind of question there, but some of the things about adaptation which are interesting are that it's much harder to centralize and, and, um, and to uh, instrumentalize, although Rockefeller are having a very good go with their wheel, um, their uh, resilience wheel. Um, those of you who know him will be pleased to know that it was Andreas Luque who came up with that wheel when he was working with Arab. And so now whenever I see that wheel around, I, I, I think, you know, he's let a monster into the world. He needs to be responsible for it. Um, so we should, uh, we should bring the wheel back to Andreas and ask him to deal with it. Um, so there is, there is some attempt to instrumentalize it, but it, in a sense it kind of disrupts the sort of uniform centralized vision of climate policy. And in, in a way then, one of the things as a, as a group of critical scholars and, and uh, activists and uh, you know, policy leaders who want to see a different approach to cities and climate change, one of the things we can do is continually bring questions of adaptation and resilience back into the mitigation debate as well because it, it means that you have to take more account of local conditions and circumstances and other issues as well. Um, uh, in terms of this question about can you see a kind of visible relationship between climate change and other areas, I mean uh, I find it relatively difficult not to see climate change everywhere but my children do tell me I'm obsessed with it. Um, that you, climate change I think has become a, well I would say that it's become an issue a bit like sort of gender equality or, or in some senses a kind of principle of democracy, that it's sort of a principle that is vaguely interest, vaguely attached to many, many different things. How sticky it is to particular areas and how much it brings things together is, is, depends perhaps on what kind of things we're looking at. But questions around, not so much around mobility, but I think the built environment, architecture and building design is pretty much all considering questions of energy efficiency, uh, climate change issues now in a way that they wouldn't have done 20 years ago. Uh, Nature-based solutions are supposed to do the same thing. They're supposed to bring climate change and health and social equity and well-being and things together as well, but we don't yet know whether they do that or not. Yeah, but, and <coughs> right, yeah, it also it's, it's supported in my understanding, but and you would agree because you're obsessed but maybe <laughs> with climate change, but that these energy and climate issues have uh, given given birth or stimulated, strongly stimulated the emergence of new local policies, for example, food policies, yeah. which were not non-existent. Yeah, I, I would think so. Mm -hmm. If any of you haven't seen it, there's a great um, project run by Anna Davies at Trinity College Dublin called Share City on food, on food waste and, f and different forms of food sharing that are going on. And they've charted across, it's an ERC advanced grant, and they have a really interesting map of all the different kinds of share, sharing food things which are going on in multiple different kinds of cities globally. So it's a really nice resource to just chart some of that and how that's emerged over time, if anyone's interested in following that up. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure the food policy at urban level are coming from the climate uh, mm -hmm. area first, but okay. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I haven't looked, digging in. Take some climate change resources. Ah, that's different. Yeah. yeah. So they may not come from there, but then they are able yeah. to keep going with the climate change. Yeah. Um, so on the first question about adapt, 
adapt, uh, yes, we see that now actually the problem is not that it's not on the agenda, is that it's too much on the agenda because uh, mayors at local level, they have to find a way. And uh, there is, it's like uh, there is a sen the sense of an er emergency all the time. It's, uh, resources are taken from mitigation action to adapt very quickly the roads, uh, this uh, bridge, uh, this uh, river that is going uh, uh, completely uh, out of the, its uh, own course. Uh, so th the, 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 uh, there is a, a problem and the problem is more about uh, the, the balance in between uh, the priorities because a lot has to be done. I mean, isn't, like in the middle of Germany, people have died uh, two years ago uh, because of uh, floods. So it's, it's really something that is for, for a mayor, yeah. uh, they, they do have to take action quickly on many adaptation measures and it takes the budget from the mitigation. Um, then, for me, the adaptation as a problem that it's not um, what I could call transformative, in a sense that uh, by mitigation, when you when the, the adapt, we we one of my fear for the covenant of mayors and for climate action in at local level is that we become the new agenda 21, because everyone wants to put climate everywhere, and and at the end we lose. The, the, this kind of transformative potential that the, uh, the energy and climate uh, issue has, which is the fact that by, by looking with these glass, sunglasses or with these glasses, you do have to transform the entire economy. Your city metabolism needs to be transformed. But the, the, what, why the covenant has been successful is because they were a, one clear target. On adaptation, it's a very, it, it's super important. It's not that it's not important. It's happening and we have to do it. But you cannot put a target. Thus, because you cannot put a target, it's much more compli complicated to, make, to, to engage, to, to, to put a, a kind of a, a shared um, responsibilities and so on. And um, yeah, I, I just witnessed, I mean, it's, it's just, to me, the energy transition and, and, and climate uh, change uh, uh, local uh, policies have this capacity to, to basically uh, aggregate because they are targeted also. And it, it doesn't mean that they are exclusive. For whether climate action is in other urban poli uh, policies, uh, actually yes, because of that. But the problem we have now is that there is no adapted urban governance to this uh, multi-sector uh, approach. So, and this is why climate is so critical to this transformative potential of, of a city urban governance, city metabolism and so on. So now what we need to invent, and we are trying to do some different projects on that, because there is a kind of a black, uh, no, a, a, a white sheet in, in, in front of us of inventing new urban governance uh, structure, which would basically could look like a, a permanent uh, climate and energy dialogue between different stakeholders because what you need to do is basically the waste heat of this uh, uh, um, company can uh, heat the entire neighborhood here and you need only one pipe and it's almost no cost and you can have a heat super, super cheap and then you can put solar there and you have to map all the treasure, you, you have to, to completely change the relationship between the different stakeholders. Thank you very much. Yeah, one last question then before, before a break. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Your uh, comment, uh, Claire, uh, make me... Uh, think about that um, uh, this adaptive uh, way is maybe a, a kind of a response to, to, uh, to um, your, your threat about uh, instrumentalization because uh, um, the, the interesting thing is uh, in adaptive uh, solution or responses you really have to, to be, uh, to, to find your own way or your own response and you, you really need to, to have a kind of a capacity and a local capacity and uh, maybe also there is a, we, we always uh, want to have some uh, 
typology or some uh, concept, you know, some uh, global and uh, concept or global typology to to um, uh, to, to to yeah to, to organize our thought and uh, but but maybe it's it's it's. It's one thing. It's uh, for me very interesting because I, I work also on on, on really local uh, uh, responses to adaptation and uh, to, uh, especially on um, small and uh, small uh, enterprises and local uh, communities. And uh, of course, you cannot cut and curl, you know, and cut and stuck. It's it's a it's a really uh, really distancing this. Distinctive uh, ways and, and, and careers of adaptation, and uh, yes, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a, um, impulse also to 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 storytelling and to, to I wouldn't say best practices because best practices has mostly the you know uh, cut and curl uh, cut and stick, but uh, uh, kind of storytelling and to to um, to make also uh, cities confident, to yes. say, okay, you, you, you can find your own way, you have to find your, uh, let's say we have to, to have a, on the regional level a, a frame, to say, for example, our forests are important. I, I am from the east, uh, east of France, uh, uh, the, the, the new region which is called the, the Grand East, and we have, we work on, for example, we have some water issue which are, which are common or forestry issue but then try to find on each very local places what kind of uh, uh, of uh, ally, 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 alliance you will we, you will uh, build and uh, how do you do you make something really specific and special which is linked to a concern Collective concept. It's not really a question. It's more. Sorry, it was just because you, you made me think about this. But the, the, the question you. of storytelling uh, to make people confident is very important. It's something that is actually coming back uh, a lot from our members when they, when we ask them uh, what do you need. They uh, uh, funnily, in a way, they don't come with uh, any kind of uh, technical things. What they want is storytelling to help that we help them to communicate. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite striking the, as a need. Okay, so uh, thank you very much to our two speakers. We will pursue the discussion conversation after Jeb Brugman's uh, presentation. So now we are having a small break. You can have coffee and choose everything you want uh, just up the stairs. Um, and um, we'll start again in hopefully in 10 minutes time with a connection to New York. Early morning New York, I must say. <coughs>